Yeah, thank you very much for your kind, welcoming words. And Professor Rahman, it looks like you took a peek at three of my transparencies when you described the LIGO experimental setup. So it made my life much easier then. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank you, members of the Board of Trustees and the faculty members for giving me the honor <clears throat> of being able to speak on uh, before a distinguished audience on a topic which has gained a lot of importance or has been the subject of discussion uh, amongst young and old scientists, non-scientists, which is gravity waves, because its implications are many. And in fact, gravity waves, as I'll discuss later, will give us a peek into what the universe was like billions and billions of years ago. Although we still don't know what it was like during what we call the inflation era, which was, uh, it's unbelievable. It's called the Planck era, and the time scale is of the order of 10 to the power minus 43 seconds, and the size of the universe was 10 to the power minus 34 meter. It's unbelievable. But we are still trying to detect those gravitational waves. Uh, in 2014, when I last time gave a talk here, it was actually on primordial gravity waves. And uh, we thought that we detected them. Later, it turned out that it was a false alarm. And uh, the waves were actually uh, produced by interstellar. So, So as I was saying, I mean, in 2015, we thought that we detected primordial gravity waves which were produced during the inflation phase of the universe. But the same group who claimed they detected the waves later retracted their claim because further analysis showed that the signal came from interstellar dust. Uh, <clears throat> Before I start my talk, I have to apologize for my voice. Uh, I had a throat surgery two and a half months ago, so it's hoarse. And I may have to pause in between one or two times, uh, but I'll restart again. And what I did is I wrote down a lot of things on my transparencies so that when I stop, you know what I was going to talk about. And <clears throat> second is, from my experience of teaching astronomy to non-science students. Uh, and in astronomy, general relativity is a big part of the syllabus. I have learned the hard way that if I write down too many equations on the board, because for us, it's much easier to explain a scientific phenomena using equations. So if I write down too many equations on the board, half the class drops the course. And the other half gives me a very bad review. And, and I remember one student even wrote down that fire this guy. So keeping that in mind, when I prepared this talk, I decided I'm going to keep the number of equations to a minimum. Only the ones that are necessary, and I'm not going to derive them. So you have to believe me that the equations are correct. And also, you have to keep in mind that I'm not an expert on general relativity. You may call me... Uh, Relativity generalist. Okay, my knowledge of relativity comes from teaching astronomy course. And <clears throat> so let's get started. Uh, the title of the talk, Gravitational Waves 100 Years in the Making. Uh, I stole it from last month's uh, American Physical Society's annual nuclear and particle physics meeting because uh, it was the big thing over there, gravity waves. I mean, we were completely drowned out. I'm a nuclear theorist. No one attended our sessions. Okay, people flocked into sessions that talked about gravity waves. So this, is actually, this was actually the theme of the talk over there. And the year 2015-2016 marks the 100th anniversary of Newton's, uh, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, it's also known as, the, as Einstein's second revolution. The first revolution being the special theory of relativity, which he, he published in 1907. 
And after the publication of the general theory of relativity, he became a major player in the cosmic drama. That means we cannot, ex anything, we cannot explain anything that's happening in the universe without invoking his theory of general relativity. And so his theory gave us an extraordinary new sight into the nature of the universe, particularly on the complex interplay between gravity, space, and time. So this is the way I plan to present my talk. Since it's about gravity, and we know that the father of gravity is Isaac Newton. So I'll talk briefly about Newton, okay, not much. I'll talk about the, his law, uh, successes of his theory, and the many shortcomings. And then go on to general relativity. General relativity, I'll describe the salient features, and then again try to show you without going into mathematical details how Einstein actually debunked Newtonian gravity. Because Einstein basically said there is no such thing called Newtonian gravity, it's something else. And then predictions of uh, general relativity, I'll talk briefly. Experimental verification, there are many, okay? But I'm going to describe precision of Mercury's perihelion because Mercury has been in the news recently uh, because uh, of the transit on May 9 of Mercury across the disk of the sun. And in fact, I wrote three articles on Mercury in the independent newspaper as a prelude to an article on the transit. And the one before the transit was precision of Mercury's perihelion. And that was one of the, uh, what should I say, solid experimental verification of Einstein's general relativity. Then gravity waves. What is a gravity wave? What are the sources of gravity waves? And then, of course, LIGO. LIGO is an acronym for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Then I'll talk about what can be learned from gravity waves. Why are we investing billions of dollars? Okay, just to detect a signal that originated billions of years ago. So there must be something in it. And then your, uh, I'm going to skip this because otherwise I'll have to keep you guys here for two years, two, or two, two hours. I'm not going to talk about where do we go from here and then conclude, okay? And <clears throat> so my first slide, I mean, the history of uh, gravity begins in 1687. The story goes that Einstein was sitting under an apple tree. It fell on his head. Historians believe that's not true. Apple actually fell on the earth. And he came up with his famous law of gravity. So according to him, gravity is an attractive force. And the force is proportional to the product of the two masses. You see big M and small m, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So that's why we call it the inverse square law. Gravity, uh, there are four fundamental forces in nature, strong, weak, although it's weak, it's weaker compared to strong, and then electromagnetic, and then gravity. Gravity is the uh, weakest of the four fundamental forces. How weak? Electromagnetic force is 10 to the power 39 times stronger than gravity. But when it comes to describing the universe, gravity takes over completely because of the masses. Because you can clearly see from this equation, if these two masses are of the order of 10 to the power 30, 10 to the power 40, then gravity becomes an important player. Now, Newtonian gravity, we like to say that it works with clockwork, clockwork precision for slow moving objects. So by slow moving, we mean that the speed is much, much less than the speed of light, which is 300 kilometers per second. Low density, which is a small mass, like planets and the suns, okay? Within the context of the universe, uh, masses are always measured in terms of sun, solar mass. We say so many solar masses. So the sun is the smallest, okay, amongst the stars. But there are stars like neutron stars whose mass, no, neutron star is also more massive than sun, okay? So the sun is probably the smallest. It allows us to determine accurately several quantities. Here, this equation, it says, how we calculate the mass of a planet using Newton's law of gravity. This big G, uh, the physics students will know what this equation is. This is the universal gravitational constant. R is the radius of the planet. G is the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. We can find out the orbital speed of a planet using this equation. This M with the subscript S is the mass of the sun, and A is the average Earth-Sun distance. We can also use this equation to find out 
the orbital speed of a moon of a planet. So in that case, all we have to do is replace the mass of the sun by the mass of the planet and replace A by the distance between the planet and the moon. We can determine the orbital period of a planet. We can determine the mass of the sun. So when I write down, this is actually known as Newtonian version of Kepler's third law. So when I write down this equation on the board in the astronomy class, I tell them that, look here, I cannot take a balance and find out the mass of the sun. Okay, so this is the only way I can find out the mass of the sun. Again, G is gravitational constant, P is Earth's orbital period, which is 365.25 days, and A is the Earth-Sun distance. These equations are exact. No approximation has been made in deriving these equations. But problems with Newtonian gravity. Two bodies are interacting with each other, but they are, in not, in, they are not in contact with each other. So this is what in the language of physics known as action at a distance force. So the question is, how does a planet respond to a force exerted by a distant object, which is the sun? How is the force transmitted through space? Because in the case of electromagnetic interaction, the force carrier is photons, okay, which is light, actually. In the case of strong in nuclear interaction, it's the gluons. And in the case of weak nuclear interaction, uh, we call them vector bosons. The particles are denoted by Z, which is a neutral particle, or W plus minus, which is positive or negative, char negatively charged bosons. Uh, their prediction, incidentally, was, uh, uh, they were predicted, their existence was predicted by Professor Salam. And he was, what in, it's one of the rare occasions on which a theoretician got Nobel Prize before his theory was experimentally verified. Because it was working so beautifully, so the Nobel Committee felt embarrassed. So he ended up getting the Nobel Prize, I think, in 1978 for that. The other failure of Newtonian gravity is how do planets know that they have to move in elliptic orbits around the sun? Why not parabolic? Why not hyperbolic? Why not in a straight line? Then, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, that classical gravity works only for low density mass. So it's, not, it's going to fail completely for massive objects you know, like black holes, galaxies, or stars whose mass is many times the solar mass. It cannot explain the observed bending of light, okay, which can be explained only by general relativity. This phenomenon is known as gravitational lensing because mass, it acts like a lens. So when light comes near a mass, it bends. Okay, just like a lens would bend a ray of light. And classical gravity failed to account for the discrepancy although it's very tiny between the calculated results and experimental observation of the precision of Mercury's orbit. I'll explain this in detail later. And actually, you know, explaining, the, explaining Mercury's precision was one of the successes of general relativity theory. So Einstein's general relativity. The first thing that comes to mind is how many of us do we, re do, do we really understand his relativity theory? In this picture, you see two gentlemen. The gentleman on the left, obviously, is Einstein. So there's no question that he knows everything about relativity. He's the father of relativity. You guys know who's this guy? Anyone? He's a famous British astrophysicist, Sir Arthur Eddington. Okay, Arthur Eddington is well known for detecting the gravitational lensing, bending of light. Okay, he's also, we also call him the tormentor, he's tormentor of uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Because uh, everything Chandrasekhar said, he said, you are wrong. So in a conversation with Einstein, this is what Eddington said, whether it was true that only three people in the world understood the general relativity, and Einstein wanted to know who's the third. Okay? Now, obviously, uh, there's more than three. I, I was not the third, I can assure you. Okay? But there's more than three. But again, I mean, it's a handful of people who actually know the essence of general relativity theory. And I have his manuscript here, okay? This is also known as Einstein's famous notebook. Okay. Uh, this is where he did all the calculations. Now, general relativity is actually an extension of his special theory of relativity. As I mentioned earlier, special theory of relativity was his first revolution. Published in 1907, it deals with what we call inertial motion. And uh, by inertial motion, it means 
you know, to make measurements, we need a frame of reference. Frame of reference can either be stationary or moving. If a frame of reference moves at constant velocity, then it's an inertial frame of reference. And Newton's laws of motion, they're valid in an inertial frame of reference. That means in simplest form, second law of motion says force is mass multiplied by the acceleration. non-inertial frame of reference. And when we deal with non-inertial frame of reference, and again, physicists and physics students know that we have to, Newton's law does not uh, we, uh, work in the way it's written, force is mass times the acceleration. We have to invoke the existence of fictitious forces. For example, Earth rotates. So something that rotates has an acceleration. We call it centripetal acceleration. So any frame of reference attached to the Earth is a non-inertial frame. So to describe the motion of objects as viewed from the surface of the Earth, we have to introduce fictitious forces like Coriolis force, which is a deflecting force, and centrifugal force. But gravity is actually the heart and soul of general relativity. That means we are dealing with objects which are moving with an acceleration over there. And uh, this is Einstein's manuscript. Uh, at that time, there was no computer, no word processor, so everything was written in hand. And uh, this is his paper, the first paper, which was published in, uh, on November 15, 2015. Uh, I'm sorry. November 15, 1915. Okay? Uh, he actually wrote five papers. This is the English translation of the paper. I wrote on the general theory of relativity is captured by deceptively simple looking equations. So you see an equation here? Let me explain the terms in this equation. Now, general, to study general relativity, we have to use a special kind of geometry which is called differential geometry. And this quantity that you see, R with subscript mu nu, is called Ricci tensor. And you can see what does it say? Describes how the curvature changes from place to place. So basically, this is responsible for the curvature of the space. Then there's a term R, okay, which is, there's no subscript. Uh, in mathematical terms, it's the trace of the Ricci uh, uh, tensor. Okay, that means the sum of the diagonal elements. And R, it defines how distances are calculated given the curvature T, okay? This is called the, <coughs> stress energy tensor. And the first equation actually did not contain this R term. Okay, it was R mu nu proportional to T mu nu. But if R mu nu becomes proportional to T mu nu, this basically tells us that the energy, pressure, and momentum of the universes is not changing. It's constant, which is not the case. Okay, the change. So to incorporate those changes, this R term was introduced. Okay. Now, the problem with this equation is this equation tells us that the universe is not static. Okay. It's either expanding or contracting. Okay. But it's not static, which was the Newtonian view of the universe. Einstein strongly believed in a static universe, so he chose to ignore what mathematics was telling him. Okay. But in 1922, two physicists, a Russian, Friedman, and a Belgian priest. They solved the equations and showed that the universe is expanding. It can, well, not only expanding, it could contract also. So what Einstein did is what all theorists do. When the theory does not agree with experiment, we introduce a fudge factor into the theory and then play around with its value so that the theory's prediction matches the experimental results. So being a theorist, Einstein did the same thing. Okay, he introduced a quantity called lambda, the cosmological constant, to make the universe static. See, this is the term. He just put it by hand. He did not solve it. He did not get it by solving the equation. Because he was so convinced that the universe is static. I have to make it static. Okay? Einstein later admitted that this was the biggest blunder of his life. When after uh, Edwin Hubble, 
beyond any shadow of doubt showed that the universe is expanding. Okay, then he believed in the uh, Big Bang theory and he said that the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation which I've ever listened and the cosmological constant is the bigger, biggest blunder of my life. But the cosmological constant did not die. Okay, it was resuscitated in 1998 when study of supernova explosions showed that the universe is not only expanding, it's expanding at an accelerated rate. Okay? So that means it's defying gravity or there is negative gravity. And the reason for that was uh, one of the theories is that there is a dark energy which is uh, propelling the universe to expand at, a, at an accelerated rate. So what is this dark energy? Einstein's cosmological constant. Einstein did not live to see his constant being revived again. Okay? But it's there. So it was not the blunder of his life after all. And again, Einstein said, anyone who has never made a mistake, never tried anything new. So true, right? Now, predictions of general relativity. Space becomes curved in the presence of matter. So you can see I have a matter here, and you can see that space got curved. Okay. If there is no matter, space is not going to be curved. It will remain flat. So Einstein's general relativity equations will fold onto Newtonian equations if the masses are small, and if the masses are small, curvature of space-time is very small. So that means without matter, space-time is flat, and it's equivalent to zero gravity. So space looks like this, no longer like this. Time slows down in the presence of matter. And this is the equation. Again, this equation is derived from general relativity theory. The various quantities in these uh, variables in this equation are this T0 is proper time for an event, which is the time measured when observer and event are in the same gravitational potential. <clears throat> then Tf is the time measured when at a large distance from any object. And M is the mass of the object, R is the distance of the object from us. According to this equation, when someone reaches the edge of a black hole, time basically freezes because a clock stops almost. That's why we'll never see an object falling inside a black hole because time just becomes, uh, just freezes. And also, you know, you know that nothing comes out of a black hole. That's, that's why it's called a black hole. Then the other prediction is gravity is not a force at all. That's why we say that Einstein basically debunked Newtonian concept of gravity. It is the manifestation of the curving of space-time continuum by massive objects. The curvature of space-time creates attraction between all the pieces of matter in the universe. And planets orbit the sun because the space around the sun is warped or curved, not because the sun is exerting a force on the planet. Now here, I mean, this shows why planets orbit the sun. You can imagine of a very simple example, take a trampoline, okay, which and then tie the four ends tightly to four posts, so it's flat. Put a big bowling ball in the middle, so what you have, you have a sink like this. Release the small balls, the balls will start moving in circular orbits around this guy. So it's the ball that's not attracting the small balls, this uh, bowling ball. The small balls are responding to the curvature of the space around, created by this big mass. So that's why he said there is no such thing called gravity. Another example he gave to debunk Newtonian gravity is imagine yourself inside an elevator and then elevator is something happened, elevator is in a free fall. So what do you feel? You feel weightless. Okay, you feel weightless when there is no gravity. Now transport yourself to a place far out in space with no objects around. You're weightless. So he says you are weightless in a gravitational field, which is the Earth's gravitational field, you're weightless in a space where there is no gravitational field. So that's why I say it's not gravity that's responsible for your weight. Okay, the curvature of the space around you is responsible for your weight. That's why when you go, when you're on top of Mount Everest, your, ma your weight will be slightly less than the weight on the Earth's surface by around 0.3%. Okay, and the reason is because the top of Everest is far away from the Earth, 
space is less curved over there than the space near the Earth's surface. Well, this is a quotation I borrowed from a famous physicist. I mean, he's prob he was probably the third person who understood gravity at that time, or general relativity. He says, time and space and gravitation have no separate existence from matter. Space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. Okay, so there is a mutual dependence between them. So let's go back to Newton's apple that fell on his head. So according to Einstein, the apple did not fall on the Earth's surface because the Earth attracted the apple. It fell into a hole okay, created by the space, uh, created by an object around it. So you can view it like this. The apple fell into the hole. When you pick up dumbbells, how do you feel? You feel something is pulling you down, right? According to Einstein, no. The gravity is not pulling you down. Because you don't want the dumbbells to fall down, you're applying a force in the upward direction. So what the dumbbell is doing, Newton comes in now. Action, reaction, Newton's third law. Okay, it's applying a reaction force on you. So you can see these guys trying to lift dumbbells. And when you lift dumbbells and feel their weight, you're not feeling the earth pulling them down, but a reaction to the upward force. Okay, you are exerting, which is keeping them from falling down. Next is gravity waves, which is considered to be the next frontier in physics. Why, how, I mean, in electromagnetic theory, okay, we know that when a charged particle accelerates, it gives off radiation. So in a similar fashion, according to general relativity, an accelerating mass should also radiate, and that's the gravitational wave. Okay, and you can just view it as <coughs> radiation of electromagnetic waves caused by accelerating charges. Uh, we can visualize, visualize these waves as perturbations in the fabric of space-time, stretching the space in one direction and compressing in another direction. So I have a video for this. Let me show you the video. Then it will become clear what I mean by stretching and compressing. Our Google can oh, okay. the page. So you see the stretching and compression here? Stretching and then compressing now. So these are basically, I mean, this is an animation of gravity wave. So this is basically a two-dimensional projection of what you saw. Okay? This is what happens if there is no gravitational wave. Okay? The shape does not change. And here you can see it's stretched horizontally, okay? in this case, and then compressed vertically. So the vice versa here. So this is what the gravity wave looks like. When massive objects move, okay, the curvature of space-time change to follow their new positions. And this produces ripples in space-time, which are the gravity waves, or the propagating gravity waves. Uh, you can view them in the following way. I mean, when a boat moves, what do you see? Ripples in the water following the boat, okay? So you can think of the ripples created by the motion of the boat as gravity waves. And here, the gravity waves are created by the motion of the massive object, okay? So have, you can see it here, these ripples. Sources of gravity waves. Any object with mass that accelerates, okay? It includes spinning objects also because when a spin object spins, it has acceleration like the rotation of the Earth. It accelerates, produces gravitational waves, including when you drive, drive a car and change the speed, okay? Or airplanes, all of us are producing gravitational waves. 
So here I see Einstein riding a bike. Okay, he's producing gravitational waves and he's changing the curvature of the space-time. Okay, it's exaggerated. Okay, because our effect is minuscule. We do not have the technology to detect uh, the warping of the space that is created by our motion. Okay, we'll have to wait several generations to come up with those kind of uh, <clears throat> machines. Okay, or to make a machine, or make to make an object spin so fast that uh, the deformation of the space becomes measurable. Okay, so that's what I wrote down here. Okay, to Pani Devan. Sources of gravitational waves, these are violent, any violent catas cataclysmic event in the universe is going to produce gravitational wave. Supernova explosion, okay, they produce what we call a tsunami of gravitational waves. So this is a supernova explosion. These are pictures taken by NASA's uh, infrared telescopes. Colliding supermassive black hole pairs. The gravity waves that were detected were actually prepared by colliding black holes. Okay. Then, of course, the Big Bang. Okay. And the gravity waves produced during the Big Bang, those are known as primordial gravity waves. Okay. And again, I mentioned earlier that they were produced during the Planck era. There are two types of gravity waves. One, we, one is called continuous gravitational waves, and they are produced by single spinning object, okay, like neutron star. Okay. Neutron stars are very small stars. Size is less than 20 kilometer radius, but they're very massive. And they're remnants of explosions of bigger stars. Our solar mass is approximately 1.4 times the solar mass. Okay, so this is a, a picture. Continuous gravity waves have the same frequency and amplitude. That means frequency does not change. So if you look at the gravity wave amplitude as a function of time, it's very uniform. Okay, it's not changing. Next is in spiral. Okay, these are also called compact binary in spiral gravitational waves. They are produced by orbiting pairs of massive and dense compact objects like black holes. Black holes are very compact and the ones that we detected were produced by two black holes orbiting about their common center of mass. White dwarf stars, black holes, and neutron stars. They are characteristically short in duration, several seconds to less than a second long. And their frequency increases as the two objects come close to each other. It becomes very large when they're very close to each other, and then suddenly it goes to zero when they coalesce. And the sound these gravitational waves would produce is a chirping sound. So here you can see this is an idealized image. When the two objects were far apart, they basically acted like continuous gravity waves. But as the distances kept on decreasing, you can see that the frequency is increasing, that the waves are becoming much closer to each other. Now, in reality, it'll look like this. Here, two objects are rotating about the common center of mass. You can see that, and they're far apart. So these are the waves. As they approach each other, you can see that the waves are shrinking. That means the frequency is increasing. And when they're very close to each other, you can see very large frequency. And then when, a, when they coalesced, we can see Now, comparison between general relativity and Newtonian gravity. First thing is action at a distance. I mentioned that Newtonian gravity cannot explain action at a distance. Using general relativity, you can see that the mediation of gravitational attraction by the deformation of space-time geometry resolves that ambiguity. Okay? The two bodies do not have to be in contact with each other to ex exert forces on each other. And the example that I gave you is those small balls, okay, revolving around a big bowling ball on a trampoline. The distortions reach their limit in the case of a star that collapses into black hole, where space-time completely folds over itself. Newtonian gravity can never reach that region. 
And then regarding the force carrier, although it's not part of general relativity, it's quantum gravity. Okay, quantum gravity is an offshoot of general relativity. What carries the force? Okay, uh, we call it gravitons, and its mass is very small. It's one one ten thousand times the mass of an electron. And uh, there's a simple formula which we can use to calculate the mass of the graviton. In this equation, c is the speed of light, h is famous Planck's constant, and big H is what is called Hubble constant. So if we plug in the numbers into this equation, we end up with this number, okay, with the appropriate units. So when you fall down, okay, are you falling down yourself or you have a company? You're riding a graviton. Okay, graviton is bringing you down. You can see this guy jumping down. You don't see it because it's so light, but it's the gravity. It's the graviton which is bringing this guy down. Okay. Newtonian theory does not have these things. Then I told you that the experimental verification of general relativity, we call it the advance of Mercury's perihelion. Uh, Kepler's first law says all planets move in elliptic orbits or nearly elliptic orbits with the sun at one of the four sides. Now the point closest to the sun, it's called the perihelion point, and the point farthest from the perihelion is called, uh, uh, farthest from the sun is called the epihelion point. Okay. Now you can clearly see that when a planet moves from epihelion to perihelion, it traces out 180 degrees or pi radians. So if the angle swept out by a planet in moving from epihelion to perihelion, if we denote it by, let's say alpha, and if the force law looks like this, one over r raised to the power n plus one, and r is the distance of the planet from the sun, then we get this simple expression for alpha. Okay, which is the angle traced out in moving from aphelion to perihelion. And you can clearly see that if n equals to 1, it's inverse square law, which is Newton's law. And in this equation, if I put n equals to 1, alpha becomes pi. Okay? And that's what we expect. And then we call that the orbit is re -entrant. But if n becomes slightly larger than 1, then I have a denominator which is less than 1, which is a smaller. So alpha becomes greater, okay? That means the orbit is no longer re -entrant. That means after one pass around the perihelion, its position changes. And here you can see, I mean, this is again a blown up picture. Initially the perihelion was at point P1, okay? Because of precision, second orbit, it moved to point P2 and then point P3. Now, this is not mathematical gimmick. Okay, it has been observed experimentally. And for Mercury, uh, it was much easier to uh, observe this phenomena because of its proximity to the sun, its closest to the sun. So it was found that Mercury's perihelion advances by about 547 arc seconds per century. Okay. One arc second is one over 3,600 of a degree. And it was first recognized by a French mathematician. Now, Newton's law of gravity, now we have other planets also, okay, around Mercury. So it's not only Sun which is exerting a force on Mercury. Other planets are also exerting forces on Mercury. So the force law is not exactly one over R square. Perturbations are created by the other planets. So if we use Newtonian law of gravity and incorporate the gravitations, uh, perturbations produced by other uh, planets, we can account for 531 arc seconds. Okay, so 43 arc seconds is unaccounted for. Many theories came up, some, some astronomers said that there is a planet called Vulcan, okay, which we haven't yet discovered, and to date no Vulcan has been discovered. Uh, some said that there is probably a strong asteroid field over there. Okay, so that also has not been discovered. And Einstein said, wait a minute. You don't have to look for Vulcan, you don't have to look for asteroid field. All you have to do is look at my gravity, general relativity. And a simple calculation showed that the angle by which Mercury will persist, okay, because of the curvature of space-time, this is the equation. It's a very simple equation. Again, A is Mercury's distance, average distance from the Sun. T is its orbital period. E is what is called the eccentricity of the orbit. If E is uh, close to one or very large, it cannot be greater than one. It has to be less than one. 
If E is equal to zero, then the orbit is a circle. And if E is very close to one, it's a very highly elongated orbit. And in the solar system, Mercury, and of course Pluto is no longer a planet. Okay, for them this eccentricity was large. So if I plug in these values, okay, this is for E, and this is the A period, it has to be in seconds, and then speed of light. Now remember, this is the precision angle per century, okay, per, rota per, per rotation. So whatever number I get from this equation, I have to multiply by 415, because uh, Mercury orbits the sun 415 times per 100 years. If you do the calculation, you'll see that this gives exactly 43 arc seconds. So that's considered to be one of the major proofs that general theory of relativity is indeed correct. Gravitational waves, its detection obviously is the culmination of decades long quest and it's considered to be the final seal of approval on Einstein's theory of general relativity. I don't think anyone can question anymore that uh, or cast doubt on general theory of relativity. Now, he already described this setup, Professor Omar Rahman. Uh, we use, uh, the, the experimentalists use laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory called LIGO. Uh, the project is jointly managed by MIT and Caltech. And the search started in 1997. And it's a mega research project. And these projects usually they run into billions of dollars. Who are the main players here? So obviously Albert Einstein. Okay. You'll be surprised to find out the next person who was the player. It's none other than our own Essen Bosch. How does Essen Bosch fit into the picture? Because the laser that's used in this experiment Okay, is based on Einstein's theory of photoelectric effect and Bose-Einstein statistics. Okay, so you cannot throw Bose out of the picture, he's there. And over 14, uh, 1,400 scientists, 1,408 to be precise. Okay, and two of them are Bangladeshis. One is at Oregon, he's a postdoc, and the other one is a professor at Northwestern University in Chicago. They're parting. Okay, in Louisiana after uh, the waves have been detected. These are uh, pictures of the LIGO facilities. Uh, this is in Livingston, uh, <coughs> Louisiana on the Gulf of Mexico. Unlike a gentleman who wrote in a Daily Star article that it's in the east coast of uh, Eastern Seaboard. Okay, it's in the Gulf Coast. This is in Hanford, Washington, DC. There are other facilities, but none of them are working right now. India is planning to build one. Uh, Japan, they call it Kagra, it's under construction, and there one in Germany, one in Italy. And uh, as Professor Omar Rahman mentioned, it consists of two long tunnels, four kilometers long, at right angles to each other. This is a, a laser wave generator. There's a beam splatter, a splitter. So when laser is sh shown on this beam splitter, it blitz, uh, splits up into two parts. One part travels along this arm, another one travels along this arm. These are mirrors, so they get reflected back. Now, if light travels exactly the same distance down both these arms, then when they reach this detector, okay, the path difference between them is zero. And uh, from optics, we know that if the path difference is equal to zero, the two waves cancel each other. And you can see that this is one of the waves, this is the other wave. So if one is positive, the other is negative. You don't see anything in the detector. This is what we call total destructive interference. By the way, I mean, physics people, I mentioned earlier that LIGO detector is no different from fabry perot interferometer. This, is ha this happens only for laser light. But if the length of one of them changes, okay, in the next slide, see, one of them is shorter, another of them is longer. Then when the waves reach, okay, this detector, the part difference is no longer zero, okay? So the waves do not completely destroy each other. And we see what is called interference pattern. Okay, so very simple, okay? If I, so wh what does the gravitational wave do? Gravitational wave changes the length, okay? Makes one, uh, compresses one, 
and then stretches the other one. Okay, so the wave travels two different paths. So the path length is not zero anymore. But remember, I mean, in the next, uh, or let me show you what, how, how this works here. This is again an animation, but this is actually what happened in the LIGO interferometer. Isn't it amazing how we detect all these things? So the waves detected by LIGO, by now we know that they were produced 1.3 billion years ago by the collision of two black holes. And uh, uh, that's uh, about 12 and a half billion years after the Big Bang. And the signal was recorded at both the facilities in Louisiana and Washington, uh, seven milliseconds apart from each other. When they collided to form a single massive black hole a portion of the combined black hole's mass was converted into energy. Okay, and length is because gravitational wave changes the frequency of light waves also. So instead, what the device measures are very tiny shifts in the period of the two light beams. Okay. And if the crests or troughs, that means the maximum or minima of the wave arrive out of sync, they produce an interference pattern. Now, that's what the LIGO people detected, but for the benefit of the people, for people like, I mean, I would say me also, what they did is they converted these signals into sound chirps. And uh, in this uh, slide, in this video, you'll see how they converted it into sound waves. It's very easy because if we have frequency, something which has a frequency, we can just uh, change it into sound waves. Okay, this is what the detector in Hanford and this is in Livingston. So this is not what the gravitational waves did. This is man-made. Okay, we just changed them into sound waves. So the two black holes are very far apart. And you see, suddenly the sound will disappear. That means the two black holes merged. Thunderstorm over there. Beginning and year? Beginning and year, John. And go here again. We don't hear anything because the two black holes are very far apart, so the frequency is very low.
ういう時、はい、ちょっと高くしよう。The length of the tunnels are changing.、Uh, things are expressed in terms of what is called fractional distortion. Change in length divided by length. Or、uh, this is, you know, stress. No, strain, right? 10 to the power minus 20 is typically, is typically ex expected. So you can imagine how small change in the length is. And this LIGO can detect, actually, this is small change. So, what LIGO measured is basically the final step of a journey that began 1.3 billion years ago. The paper has been published. The title is Observation of Gravitational Waves from a Binary Black Hole Merger. It's published in Physical Review Letter, which is a very prestigious physics journal. And Physical Review Letter essentially will publish results which have.、Uh, Very important significance and needs rapid communication. This is, I mean, I'm just, I'm not going to explain this. I mean, this is what you actually、uh, heard a sound wave. Okay. So, what can, we, what can we learn from gravity waves? Now, until gravity waves are tools of the trade where electromagnetic radiation or light, light carried most of the information from distant objects. Then, what we call cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the leftover remnant radiation after Big Bang. When I say after Big Bang, it's 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Because before that, it was known as the dark age of the universe. Because radiation could not escape before that. So, cosmic background radiation carries information、uh, from 380,000 years after. But we can extrapolate backward and find out what happened. But the ex extrapolation fails completely when we try to go into the Planck era. The other one is what we call the redshift. Redshift is shift in the wavelength of a radiation as an object moves away from the, uh, 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 from the detector. So that's how Hubble came to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. Because when he looked at galaxies, Okay, he saw that the, that the light from the galaxies got redshifted. And that can happen only when the source of light moves away from the observer.、Okay? And again, in the case of the universe, it's,、uh, I have to emphasize that、uh, galaxy is not moving away, it's the space that got stretched.、Okay? It's simple like, I mean, you put two dots in a balloon and start inflating the balloon, what do you see? The spacing between the two dots increases, the dots are not moving. Okay, the space got stretched. So that's what happens in the universe. So these were the three things, or our three tools. So gravity waves is now the fourth and one of the most important tools for studying the universe. And gravity wave is the only thing that can give us information about what happened in the Planck era or the inflationary phase of the universe. Because laws of physics fail over there simply because during the Planck era, Gravitation was repulsive, not attractive. And all four fundamental forces were united. Okay, now they're separate. But during the Planck era, they were all united. What else can we learn? We can infer the ma masses of the colliding objects from their frequency. And、uh, frequency is number of waves passing a particular point in space per second. Analysis of LIGO data indicated that the two colliding black holes. One of them had a mass of 29 solar mass, the other one 36. So that's 60, 65. So this figure shows 29, sol 29 solar mass, 36 solar mass. But the combined black hole had 62 solar mass. So three solar mass that got converted into energy and propagated as gravity waves. The amplitude or the maximum size of the waves. Can reveal how far away the merger occurred. Okay, so these are basically the tools we use to find out different things. We can estimate the direction the waves came from, 
and then deduce from that information which galaxy hosted the merger. Okay, it's not our galaxy. I mean, this merger did not take place in the Milky Way, uh, but uh, still, I mean, analysis is going on. We are still not sure which galaxy hosted, but we know that it's far beyond our local group of galaxies. The waves can tell us how a black hole affects the objects around it. And since the waves are created by accelerating objects, we can use gravity waves as a speedometer to find out the rate at which the universe is expanding, just like a car's speedometer. More importantly, the discovery forms the power of gravitational waves, no matter how small they are, to unlock the secrets of the cosmos. What the waves won't tell us, it's not going to give us any information about the Big Bang. Because these gravity waves were detected, were produced 1.3 billion years ago. Whereas Big Bang occurred 13.7 billion years ago. Okay? So forget it. Okay? We can learn nothing about the Big Bang. Okay? All the way that article in Daily Star led us to believe that we now know everything about Big Bang from this detection of this gravity wave. This is the spectrum of gravity wave. And you can see that the gravity waves that originated uh, right after the Big Bang, its frequency now is 10 raised to the power minus 16. So very low frequency, so that means its wavelength, because wavelength is inversely proportional to the frequency. And the wavelength is of the order of light years now. And we don't have, uh, I mean, the longest wavelength telescopes are radio telescopes. But the radio telescopes that we have are not sensitive or cannot detect waves whose wavelength is so large. So that's why this experiment in South Pole, which is known as BICEP, I mean, they're look, going to look at the gravity waves imprinted on the cosmic microwave background radiation, okay, to detect those primordial gravity waves. Then within this frequency range, uh, you can use pulsar as a clock, because pulsars, they're highly reli reliable. They send out radio pulses at regular intervals, which we can detect. But if there is a gravity wave uh, around the pulsar, then there will be a slight change in the arrival time. So there are experiments going on, okay, which are going to use pulsar timing, and they're known as pulsar timing array, or we call it PTA. Then there are space LIGO. Okay, space LIGO can measure, uh, are tuned or sensitive to this frequency range. And of course, this is the one that we detected. 10 to the power 2 hertz. Many people ask, why is gravitational wave such a big deal? Okay, it's a big deal because we weren't there to document an event that happened billions of years ago. And it's only the gravity wave that can tell us what happened so many billions of years ago. Conclusions. First is general relativity is consistent with the detected signal by LIGO. These experiments give us yet more insight into the vast, vast universe, and we have to admire the technological developments okay, that can measure a strain of the order of 10 to the power minus 20. LIGO opened the era of gravitational wave observatory. So this is the fourth tool, but the most powerful tool. First direct measurement of black hole pairs, spins, and source of gravity wave was indeed compact binary coalescence of high mass black holes. So that means, uh, I mentioned earlier that these what we call the in, sp in spiral waves. So we are now sure that these are in spiral waves. It provides a mathematical framework that will allow scientists to wind the cosmic film backward. Because remember, what we detected today actually happened 1.3 billion years ago, not today. <coughs> scientists might at last be able to unite the so far stubbornly uncooperative theories of general relativity and quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics and general relativity, they move in opposite directions. That's why Einstein, initially, he did not believe in quantum mechanics, especially Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And his famous quotation is, God doesn't play dice with the universe, because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And the discovery affirms the power of gravitational waves to unlock new secrets of the cosmos. Now, is Newton's theory of gravity really dead? So I wrote a piece on December 18, 2015, again in the Independent, 
just to tell people that no, Newton is not dead. Newton is still alive. So if you look here, when the curvature of space-time is small, Einstein and Newton see eye to eye. What goes up must come down. Okay, they both agree. As the gravitating masses increase, Einstein dethrones Newton and begins to rule the universe. There are no indications that Einstein's century-long reign is going to end soon. Okay. This is quote-unquote me. I did not borrow it from anyone else. And thanks to Einstein, we live in a universe of curved spaces and altered time, filled mostly with dark energy. We cannot see, we don't know what it is. Dark matter we cannot see, but we know it's there and black holes through which we can leave the universe, never to come back again. So it's a one-way ticket we have. And this is what Einstein said about his general relativity theory. If my theory is proven successful, Germany will claim me as a German and France will declare I'm a citizen of the world. Should my theory prove untrue, France will say I'm a German and Germany will declare I'm a Jew. But he died as an American in 1955. So thank you very much, and this is my acknowledgement, acknowledgement okay, to Professor Omar Rahman and uh, the Board of Trustees and the faculty members for giving me this opportunity to talk on this highly technical subject. And as promised, I did not use too many equations, and I saw that none, no one leave, left the auditorium. So it's not like my astronomy class. Okay, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have now.